Pasamos ahora a la próxima conferencia, que es de una persona que me parece que no necesita presentación. Es archiconocido, es el señor X. Speakerman, que ya estuvo en España varias veces, estuvo eh, aquí en Barcelona y dio una conferencia eh, una o dos veces, me parece, en Valencia, desde luego también. El señor Speakerman es posiblemente una de las personas o la persona que más eh, honores eh, ha recaudado en su vida, porque tiene doctorados, tiene medallas y ha creado 30 fuentes tipográficas, que eso también es una gran tarea de conseguirlo. Te escuchamos, Eric. Hola, ¿qué tal? That's it. Um, that's going to, no, it's not going to be the only slide tonight. I find this a very interesting mixture. We have all these people speaking different languages. We have a, a Scotsman with a French accent. Now we have a German with a German accent and all in Barcelona, which is also bilingual. I think this, this is what I like about Europe. Uh, I can go to all these places and I can pay with the same money. Except the stupid Brits, of course. Um, <laughs> sorry. I wasn't going to be political tonight. This is my test slide. Um, I have to apologize to the interpretadores, interpre whatever you Sounds like matadores up there. Those poor gentlemen who have to translate me. I speak uh, rapidamente, you know, very quick German, because I'm 71 and, you know, I don't have much time, so I've got to say everything quickly. Um, <laughs> I did send them a kind of uh, a preview of my talk, but they only got it an hour ago. So the poor people, thank you for your amazing work. I don't know whether it's amazing because I'm not listening to them, but it's hard work. <laughs> um, where was I? Yes, and thank you to uh, Wolfgang. Um, I don't really do lectures anymore because I need to stay home and, and do some work. And all this traveling is fun, but it's also tiring and, and exhausting. But he is called Hartmann, which I think is hombre duro in Spanish or something. So he does not give up. Um, he persuaded me to come. And, you know, of course, Barcelona is a great place to come to. Except the weather here is worse than back in Berlin today, <laughs> which uh, I found amazing. I just realized, having seen what uh, Alain said, that I actually have a museum in Berlin. I didn't realize it was a museum. We just have old shit there, but uh, I guess... You can call the museum. Now, the, the new motto is, by the way, in case you haven't heard this, analog, as we say in German, is das neue bio, is the new organic. Everybody's gone analog. Uh, I know Facebook is not going to appear, disappear anytime soon. Too bad. I wish they would disappear tomorrow. But there are already movements, you know, back to doing things with our hands again, as we, as we all know. Uh, it may have been a hipster movement, whatever. I call what we do in Berlin uh, is hacking Gutenberg because we use, as you will find out, digital ways of keeping the old stuff going. Uh, just a quick little overview uh, in case not everybody here knows uh, who I am. This is my name, obviously. Uh, this is a book that I didn't write. I just had it. It was written about me, so it's kind of interesting um, it's embarrassing to have to write, I could never write a book about myself, that would be really embarrassing. So it's nice to have it somebody, somebody else do it. I am from Berlin, as you can see. And, yeah, it's, you know, you want to have a street name for you, it's pretty interesting. I like that. It, nothing to do with me, but you don't know that, all right? <laughs> Pretend. Um, I did start off uh, way, way, way a long time ago uh, as a letterpress printer, and I had hair, yes, and a beard, of course. I was a, a hipster before hipsters existed, obviously. <laughs> uh, so that was, I was in my 20s, I went to university, I had a family, and uh, I earned my living as a, as a printer. I had, a, you know, I had collected lots of equipment because in the 60s, People were, th as, as we heard from Alan, were throwing it away. Letterpress was finished, and I got myself a, a large uh, truck, 
uh, for 100 marks at the time, and I drove around Berlin, and everybody said, eh, are you the crazy guy who collects this shit? And they threw it out the window, literally, and I had suddenly had all these printing presses. And I, I printed stuff and, um, in, my, in my little production, and at the same time, I was a graphic designer. Uh, some of you may remember what a rapidograph is, a letter set. So this is, I'm sitting there waiting for clients to call with my analog telephone, you know, nobody called. Um, and then for a lot of reasons, I uh, moved to London in, in the 70s because my, my wife was English. Well, she's still English. She's not my wife anymore. Um, I have a very mixed family, by the way. My, my son is half English. My grandson, Magneto, is half Spanish and quarter English, quarter German, lives in Zaragoza. So I have a very European family, um, which is great. That's what I like about Europe. You know, we can actually marry each other and divorce each other, and <laughs> it's all free. So I, uh, by this time, I had a lot of printing equipment, and it was a very, very large truck, 25 tons. I moved it to London, uh, moved it into a, a railway arch. I don't know what a railway arch is in Spanish. You know, one of those things where the, the viaduct. Um, uh, in via dotto in Italian, whatever it is in Spanish. Um, when I try to speak Spanish, at the moment Italian comes out because I've spent more time in Italy at Cornuda, the Tipoteca. So that was what my printing press looked like after the fire. I went for vacation in Italy. I should have maybe gone to Spain. And I came back and the place was kaput, as we say in German, um, in July 77. So I wasn't a letterpress printer anymore. All my type was gone. My hair was also starting to go. So instead, I took on photo setting, which uh, Wolfgang, of course, remembers. That's the famous or infamous DIA type, which uh, used negatives. Well, that's actually diatronic, but none of you will. Well, some of you may remember. This is how we set type during the late 60s, through the 70s, into the 80s, until the Macintosh arrived, and it really became digital. So I started working for Berthold. I designed all the type specimens for a long time. I did some type physics for them. And um, in those days, the funny thing is that when we made artwork, at least in Germany, we set type into position. So, well, you can't see very much here. I can see a little more here. There's some green stuff there. In order to, to set an illustration like this, for example, you would have to mark it up. You have to give an X, Y position to every element. Uh, and we use those grid sheets here that uh, I designed for Berthold. So today we would call this a baseline grid, but we also call it a baseline grid, actually. Um, so for every different baseline grid, we had a pre-printed sheet, and we would mark up our type on it in position. So when HTML started in the 80s, I thought, oh, I've done this. I mean, it was X and Y, you know, down and across, and then open brackets, called the typeface, so HTML for me was like second nature. It wasn't anything I, that was unusual. So we had those, you know, that's on the right, that's how I would mark up a page. And um, sometimes accidents would happen, you would pick the wrong disk uh, in, in the typesetter, but you wouldn't know until you develop the film, and sometimes you just leave it. So in the, in the 80s, I went to, um, started going to America. I worked for Adobe and Apple and a couple of other people in ITC. And uh, every time I went there, I brought back those, again, some of you may remember, the little uh, floppy disks that had fonts on them. They were being called fonts then, before they were called typefaces. Um, and then everybody said, oh, bring me, you know, I need Palatino, I need Helvetica, whatever. So I realized, wait a minute, there's a business here. So in 1989, we started Fontshop, the first um, online, well, it wasn't online, it was a mail order business. There was no online in, in 89. Um, so we distributed, we were the first in independent distributor of fonts, of typefaces. We printed catalogs, lots of them, they go bigger every year. And I was the proofreader, so I had to, Half of that, probably the reason for my divorce, I spent every evening, every night in bed reading uh, 1,500 pages of A, A to B, which you can imagine is pretty boring, but somebody has to do it. Eventually, the, the font book got really, really big, 1,700 pages, and it became very impractical. And then when it became this size, we decided, nah, 
Uh, you can print this, but you can't, you can't ship it anywhere. So we stopped, now it's just an app. You can still get it. Uh, just a very quick, uh, um, Wolfgang mentioned a, a very quick overview, um, not quite up to date from the book, uh, this is so three years ago, of all the typefaces I designed. I'm only showing this because there's a lot of it, but I also have to say, and if ever you, you have designed the typeface, you realize this is not done by one person. I didn't design all those. I mean, I designed them, but I didn't make them. There's always a few people involved. Um, I do stuff um, very basically. I'm pretty slow digitally. I still draw, and then I pass it on to colleagues, to friends who produce the extra weights, uh, do the digital work. The kids uh, who are half my age, or even less than half my age, are much quicker and much better than I would ever be. But looking back, I'm surprised how much stuff I've done. It's, it's sometimes you think, shit, whatever, where have I been all these years? I've designed all that stuff. Go away. It's not going away. Ah, okay. And a lot of it is, is um, a corporate stuff. You know, they, if you want to make money as a type designer, uh, the best thing to do is work for large companies. They pay uh, a big license or they pay you to actually do the work. Uh, like, uh, you know, the, the stuff for German Railways and for Audi and Volkswagen and, and all these big companies. Um, so as a warning to all your type designers here, if you ever want to become a millionaire, uh, that was my first check from ITC, one dollar and nine cents. Uh, so you're not going to be rich very quickly, believe me. I'm still not rich, uh, even though the money, this is ITC Officina, which I designed in 88, 89, or 90, whatever came out, I still get money for it. I mean, some people actually buy licenses, some people pay for it. It may not, um, you may not believe it, but um, right, Andrew, some people actually pay. I know it's amazing, but uh, I actually get, I mean, I wouldn't be rich anytime soon, but it's, sometimes it's nice, I can buy books. Talking about books, so now to, for, for today. Uh, I've been officially retired from my, my company, Aiden Spiekermann, for about three or four years now. I think it's four years. And so I can finally do what I like doing, which is designing books. Uh, I have these friends, publishers called Secession, or Secession uh, who do about a book every month, and I design them all. I typeset them all, I do everything. And because I don't charge money for it, I can do whatever I like, which is also nice. Um, because if they don't pay, they can't say, you know, I don't like this. They get one design and that's it. Um, and the best thing about it is that I get to, to use all these typefaces that I've had over time from my friends, like some of these from the 80s, from my, my, my Dutch colleagues. And the best thing for me, and I only do typography, I can't, well, sort of, I, I'm really bad at Photoshop. And uh, I'm not an illustrator, so I, I get to use all my fonts finally. I probably have 15,000 on my computer. And what's amazing uh, today is uh, having come from a hot metal letterpress background as I have, being old enough, the choices we have today, if you design a book uh, on, in InDesign or whatever other program it is on the computer, it's amazing. You have thousands of typefaces, you have all the details, you have small caps, and you can define your own figures, and you can change the tracking and the sizes. It is absolutely incredible what you can do. I don't think there's ever been a better time uh, for, for designing anything, books, magazines, newspapers. Uh, if there are bad uh, um, books and newspapers out there, it's not because of the technology. It's because people are lazy and want to get rich quickly. Um, there is, no, no, there is no excuse for, for doing bad design work anymore. In the meantime, there are people still printing books, uh, typesetting them in monotype, or even linotype. Um, I don't think there's much linotype left. But these books are incredibly precious. This is the whole works of Shakespeare got reprinted for the Folio Society in England. And these books sell for about five, 600 euros, uh, which, you know, I mean, you don't, you're not going to read it. You're going to put it away. You wear white gloves and show it off to your friends when you have a party or something. I don't know. No, a party is probably a wrong place. It's a museum at home. But then you look at it in detail. This is bad type. I mean, look at that. I, I wouldn't, I mean, look at that baseline. You know, that is disgusting. I know I, I'm, I have some, Wolfgang knows some of the people that I know, you know, like Eckhart Schumacher Gebler, who thinks this is the only way to go, and I show this to him, I said, this sucks. 
If somebody gave me this type, I would not pay for it. If I did this, I would use maybe Adobe Caslon and, and do it properly. Which brings me, so that's not where we're going. There is the market for letterpress, the bibliophiles, the people who pay, the book collectors, who don't read books, they collect them, and maybe they wait for the designer to die, which in the case of Bodoni is going to take a long time because he's been dead for, 100, for 200 years almost. Um, so they just, I guess, the speculate is kind of like a Bitcoin in, in, with letters. You wait for it, for the value to go up, uh, and then you die and you have the most books, and uh, maybe there's a price if you die with the most books. I am going to die with the most wood type, by the way. That's my ambition. Um, so go to, we go to Berlin now. We, we really ta start talking about this. Berlin in the winter is a, is a very, very, very black and white place. Uh, we don't have any color there, and uh, as you can see, we're all very serious Germans. And uh, actually, there's two Americans in the picture. But, um, you know, we wear our proper aprons, and uh, we print in Fraktur only, of course. Um, we have workshops, and uh, students come in, mostly people who work in the online environment, graphic designers, front encoders, and you have to do a lot of explaining because they don't realize that what they think they invented, like a baseline grid, uh, has been around for 500 years. Um, so, you know, that's basically, this is Jan, one of my, my, my colleagues there. You have to tell them, you know, what to do. But it never fails, especially to the front end people, to look at this thing. Look, I printed this. And I remember, and I really do, I, I must have been about 12 years old. Uh, I lived next door. Well, I lived, we lived, my, my parents lived next door to a printer, and I remember going in there, I did the, the school newspaper, I suppose, which was uh, set in, in metal and, and printed. And um, so you see this press, a little proofing press, obviously, I didn't know at the time, and you have all this type and the spacing, and it's all like brass and metal and wood, and it's greasy and dirty, and you know, you always have dirty hands. And then he put this white piece of paper on the press, crank the handle and pull this paper away and there was type on it suddenly. And I thought, this is bloody amazing. I mean, how did this happen? This dirty stuff suddenly looks clean and I can read it. And I will never forget that, that moment. It was totally magical. So people who come to our workshops get that same thing. They're used to putting, hitting the return key on the computer and you know, something happens, but they don't know why it happens and where it happens. I mean, I don't know. You know, how, where is this shit? Like, look at this. I mean. It's ridiculous. It's in there, but how did it get in there? How does it get out there? It's still a miracle to me and to most of you, I'm sure. Whereas here, you know, we can touch the stuff. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little overexposed or the wrong resolution. But uh, by the way, thank you to the technicians here. I come with my computer, I forget my adapters, and they make it work. So that's always uh, always nice to have people who know what they're doing. So this is, uh, these are our tools, and the most amazing thing, of course, is what people forget, that you have to touch the stuff in between. There is no white space. It's, that's white space. It's metal that you have to put down. And if you're lazy like I am, or old, and you have to hurry up, you make things simple. You use large pieces, not small pieces, um, because it's quicker. And I just realized, I think, this is my, my, uh, my warehouse that we buying this stuff. It's like back in, 19, in the 1970s. Uh, there's a Ludlow there and a monotype and, and all sorts of stuff. Why, what, what do I want with this stuff? And it's all in black and white. But we do occasionally do, do, do uh, print in two colors. I like gold. I like printing gold. Gold in letterpress is absolutely magic. It's, it, it's that, that metallic quality. Uh, we, we love it. So sometimes we print gold. And uh, little posters, this is even for, we, we don't charge money for anything, but this is something I actually got paid for. I wanted to point out the little, this is a, a, a series of porcelain uh, called Orbit, duh. And this is made up not from type, but from ornaments. And this is the slide for Wolfgang here. Futura Schmuck, it's not a Yiddish word, it's ornaments in English. Um, well, of course, that's not for Tura, but it's, it's that stuff here that uh, used to be ornaments, but I like making words with it, which is, of course, totally stupid. It's a lot of work. This is what it looks like. And uh, I've had it recast in metal, which is, again, very, very stupid thing to do. It's very expensive. 
You can find the original matrices somewhere, and then there's one type foundry left in Germany, in Darmstadt. And Rainer Gerstenberg, there does stuff for me, and I only make him do stuff because if I didn't give him work, he would disappear. So it's kind of like, I could send him money, but it, I do send him money, but he sends me back types. So it's a good deal for both of us, I suppose. And I, I love working with these ornaments because it's, uh, I'm sure you can all read that. It's a company called Phonocut that actually makes vinyl, you know, analog uh, records. So apart from, from uh, uh, gold, we also print red. I like red. I like red a lot. In fact, I like black and red. That's all I ever do because I'm lazy and old. Um, we do have a few things that we sell, like this uh, um, calendar, which will last another 2,000 years. In fact, it's, it's always right. It's, we've had it for five years, and it never runs out of date, which is quite amazing, I except when you forget to turn the page, of course. Um, and the most amazing thing about type is we've learned I'm sorry about these incomplete sentences. It's a nightmare for those two people. I start a sentence and then I, go, <laughs> I do apologize. <laughs> it's because my brain is kind of like I need food. Um, well, <sighs> it's been a long day. I've, I've been awake since four o'clock. Where was I? We've learned that, that, that type is uh, not an image. That type is type. But if you look at this, these things, I mean, they're also objects, aren't they? I mean, they are, you know, this is all really old stuff. Most of it hardly works. It takes uh, all your time to make it print. But I think it's incredibly beautiful. So when I retired, uh, well, now it's almost five years ago, I rented this workshop uh, in, in, in the middle of Berlin. And in the summer, we, we do have full color in Berlin. In winter is only black and white, but... Uh, in maybe in March, we go back to full color. So when I go back, it'll be black and white still. But if you come out in the summer, it'll be full color. This is probably two years old because we keep changing machinery because sometimes a new press comes in and throw out an old one or move it to the warehouse. Um, well, we, we have a little Heidelberg. Everybody has to have a Heidelberg windmill because it's the coolest machine ever. And it doesn't break. I mean, this is from 1952 or something, and it just goes. It's not easy to use, but it just is amazing. It also kills type. I mean, don't ever, you know, press metal, metal type um, because it destroys it. So we usually use uh, not, well, we use old type on it. So it's kind of like, what is it? We, it's a museum. It's a workshop. I'm not quite sure. Having heard Eleanor, I think it's a museum. But our motto is preservation through production. I don't like all these museums where you have a you know, red tape on it says, don't touch. Now, this is, we touch everything. Everything is old. It may, may qualify as a museum, but we touch everything. And um, what's, the, what's the optimum, the maximum, or the optimum number of books you can have, bicycles you can have, in my case, of types you can have? N plus one, right? There's always one more that you need. Um, so there is never, this is the typeface, fanfare, right? That uh, Andrew did design something very similar. This is 1927 Louis Oppenheim. I have it in all the sizes, from there to 40, 42 lines, Cicero. Um, I, I love it. It's, um, it's just amazing that somebody can do something. There is not one straight line in there, and it works. It's quite amazing. Yeah, we print those posters because we like to, and uh, we sell some of them because that's the one way you can make money. We print 50, and I sign them, which for some reason makes them more valuable. Um, anybody could sign them. It would make them valuable, whatever. It's weird. And uh, my wife, who's blonde, has a motto. Um, and the best thing about printing these things is that you make mistakes. I mean, we printed this poster and went for lunch, and we came back and said, wait a minute. Something is wrong here, and because you don't see it, you you know you're so close that makes you far away because it's all like in the press. So we we corrected it, but the first 15 that were wrong is what everybody wants to buy now because they are wrong. They are precious. We also print um, a magazine. I have some of the stuff. I have some of the stuff here if you wanted to uh, look later. 
I don't know why we print this magazine. It's all in English. It's, um, some of it is we print on a risograph, so we do have electricity and we are quite uh, modern. Um, the cover is usually printed in, uh, in letterpress. The only reason we do this magazine is because we like printing. Uh, I mean, we just like printing, so why don't we print a little magazine that some people even buy, but basically it's, it's an investment. I will soon run out of money and then I'll have to do something else, but for now I'm putting all my savings into, into there. So the best thing is to die very quickly because then there'll be some money left or, or else I'll have to start not eating or something because the money is going to run. So the covers we always print letterpress. And it's just, I don't know why it is fun. I mean, it, it stops being fun when you print 100. You know, like 100, and then you print it twice in two colors, then it gets kind of tedious. But it's also fun. You put the music on, you have coffee, and you print. And it smells nice, and, and in the evening, you got something done. That's the best thing about it. Digital, you close your computer, there's nothing left. There, you go back, and you have a stack full of paper. It's fantastic. Talking about mistakes, I mean, some of those mistakes write themselves. So when you set... This is accidents grotesque in 20 uh, Cicero. I just heard you use it, you call it the same, which is 20 pica, which is 20 times 12, if you want to look in points or pixels. So it's kind of that size. Um, normally when you print something, because in, in, in the case you have very few characters, you have to count the characters. I didn't in this case. I started setting it and then I realized, oh scheiße, I only have four E's. Okay, leave one out. Everybody thinks it's really clever to have the word perfect with one E missing, but it wasn't clever, it was just dumb, I didn't think. So, so there, sometimes, and that's the good thing about, you can call it constraints, you can call it necessity, uh, as opposed to here where I have 100,000 fonts and I have, you know, I can have million, billions of pixels and apparently 14.7 million colors or whatever, I, I only know three, um, gold, red and black. White is not a color, as you know. By the way, did you know that we can't see black? Obviously we can't, because it's black, right? There's no light. We see white. That's why type designers have to design the white and not the black. You forget, we print black, but we can't see it. So isn't that strange? We have black ink, but you can't see it, because it's black. Weird. Dogs, by the way, can only see blue and yellow. Did you know that? You don't have to know that, forget it. <laughs> I don't know what made me think of that. <laughs> um, blue and yellow dogs, yeah. I, how do we find out that box is the only... Who did you talk to? Which dog told you I can only see blue and yellow? Amazing. Yeah, Ferdinand, my assistant, who is a little taller than me, two or three, um, suddenly makes that big poster look very small. That's 50 by 70 there. And the other one is... I got some friends in America write to me, said, how big is that poster? Okay, I said, well, <laughs> it's actually two posters. If you turn it sideways, you get a second one, which is then wider than the first one. Okay, you get that. So we print those, on, on, and we have another location where we have uh, some more presses, and I just wanted to show you that so we, met, we restored this Johannesburg uh, stop cylinder press uh, from 1926 which prints 130 by 96 centimeters. That's a Swiss Welt format. And that thing is, the Americans say, a bitch. Wherever you translate that into Spanish or Catalan, it is a, a hell of a machine. It has those most amazing bearings. Um, we restored it, it took about three years to bring it back to production. And then I was the one who had to press the button. And I was so scared because it could have exploded, it could have fallen all over the place, so I was like, but it's electric, and it actually works. Um, I don't know why it works to this day, but it works. But it they used to print newspapers, you can print four pages of large, uh, full-size uh, newspapers. And I'm going to print a newspaper. God knows why. I guess that's my museum, but uh, things work. The trouble is you can't find anybody to work them. There's two people who print on that machine. There's me and another guy because nobody dares. It's so scary. There's a big museum that uh, Alan didn't mention in America, the Hamilton Wood Type Museum uh, in, in, in Wisconsin. Don't go there. The weather sucks. The food is horrible. 
Uh, in fact, Silvio Antiga, the, the fellow who runs uh, Tipoteca in, in Cornuda, Italian, he has his own restaurant. He went to Wisconsin and he came back and said, it is like a, it is like a gulag. They eat this stuff, it's not a food. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm imitating Italian. Uh, he was totally disgusted that anybody can go to a place where the food is like dog food. Not that I've eaten dog food, but it, was, it is actually inedible. Uh, so go there, bring your own food. I mean, McDonald's is a culinary delight compared to what they eat there. It is, I don't know, but you know, they also have Trump stickers on their cars everywhere. So maybe that has something to do with it. I wasn't going to be political. Anyway, they asked me to design a, a, a typeface for them that they would cut in wood. They would, would cut, they would cut in wood. Um, they use a pantograph. Shall I make a drawing? You know what a pantograph, it's a big, big thing that moves in scale and, and has a little a roundy bit at the end and it cuts into material. So you make them a, a drawing. So when I designed this for them, A, I'm lazy, so I only did capitals. And I didn't want the extra work that you have when you design a, a wood typeface. You, can, you can't go into, you can't have pointy corners. The corners are always round, so they have to go in afterwards and cut them clean, except with my next invention, which I'll show in a minute. So I designed it. There is not one straight corner in this whole typeface. And another thing you learn when you design wood type, there is no side bearing, whatever side bearing is in Spanish. It's the space next to a character, the meat, the flesh. and at the bottom. So you go as tight to the, uh, the, the body as possible. Uh, in this case, it's three units out of a thousand. Andrea knows what I'm talking about. And uh, they cut it for you in America, and it's kind of like the right size, never properly because it's American. It's like Chevrolet cars, you know, it's kind of, they're not Mercedeses. So over time, we, we have, we've had all these typefaces cut for us, and I think it's, they're all supposed to be the same size, but they're all slightly different. I don't know what it is with these people. They can't measure. I give them really precise instructions down to a thousand millimeter, and they're like, eh, whatever, you know. They, have, they forget that the saw blade has a thickness, which you have to deduct. The amazing thing is that, you know, 1937, for example, Berthold already had a material which is a resin. Um, whatever, a resin is probably called resin in Spanish, right? It's, it's artificial wood. It has wood and glue, essentially. Uh, they made this amazing material called placadur, as in, you know, made for posters, but hard. Um, and it's ne there's never been better type than this. It's incredibly sharp. I have no idea how they did this. Uh, and we have it today. It's very precious. Uh, I don't let other people use my placadur type because it is also quite delicate. Um, but over time, we've, we've designed, we, we've tried making... Don't ask me why we would make wood type. Why does anybody want to make wood type? You never have enough characters. You always have the wrong size. Uh, and it's delicate and it's expensive. It's cost me about three euros for a character. But, so we tried all these magnesium, nylon, 3D printing, which is actually happening, except the pre 3D printing works if the, the material, the, the, the powder is the price of cocaine. I mean, I don't know what cocaine costs, but it's very expensive. You get a little bag and it costs like 100 euros. Sorry, uh, I really don't know what, how much coke costs. Maybe somebody can help me. Um, it is hellishly expensive, but eventually it'll get cheaper, like, you know, and when we can 3D print characters. I don't know why, but it's fun. It's fun to do these things because it's doing things, right? It's like, I mean, you know, I, we all are like children, hopefully, and I'm certainly like a little boy, you know, and little boys make things or little girls make things. And you take, how I learned about mechanics, it was taking things apart. I know I had my first bicycle when I was 12, and I took it all apart because I wanted to know how it works. Of course, I couldn't put it together again because I was only 12, so my father had to help me, but now I know how bicycles work by taking them apart. And the same with our printing presses. They, they fall apart and you take them apart and you realize, oh my God, this part, this part, this part, and then you know how it works, only by taking things apart. So there. And like, like most of us, we all have, I'm sure all of you have sort of secret um, loves. I, for some reason, have always loved this particular cut of Accidents Grotesque. Maybe because I was for, first saw it when I was 15 or something. And this particular one is, is wood type only in large sizes. It doesn't exist anywhere digitally. So when Johannes wrote this book about me, 
I said, well, I'm not going to get involved in, in designing, helping with the design, because that's the worst thing, that, that you know, two people design a book. I'll, I'll leave you to it. You design the book. He did those stupid holes and, and you know, whatever. He's a graphic designer. You know, they have weird ideas. Um, but I said, I will design a typeface for this book. Only if you, and you can only use the one weight. One weight, you can use two colors, black and red, of course, um, which gives you already two typefaces, right? Black and red, I mean, that's two already. And then you have white, so you already have three, three types of um, um, disciplines to go with. So I designed this typeface, and of course, over time, uh, the font shop people persuaded me to turn it into big families, because now Real, which you appreciate here, is called Real, not in Madrid, but as in royal, as in regal, as in also real. Uh, it's my favorite typeface, now I have it for myself. And of course, then I went like an idiot and had it cut for me in wood. Uh, I found somebody in all, of all places in Romania, in Bucharest, an architect uh, and his wife, or an architect and her husband, um, who for some reason have been cutting type for American uh, um, wood type manufacturers. But they couldn't really do um, the detail, the, the sharp corners, as I said before. So what we're doing now is anybody here into, uh, into uh, uh, wood cutting, you take um, a CNC uh, milling machine and it has the little bit at the end, a little cylinder that, that turns and, and cuts in the corners. Now if you take a conical shape like this, and you raise it as you go into the corner, it makes a very sharp corner. So you have to use a 3D CNC machine. And that's kind of like the idea I had, and it works. So they make pretty sharp type, and you don't have to go after it. And uh, another, um, of course, issue is that I can have as many characters as I want if I pay for them. So instead of only having four E's, I can get, how many do I have? 24. I just tell him how many I want, and if it ever breaks, uh, I call um, Tudor and Petrescu in, in Bucharest and say, Tudor, I need three E's or five I's or whatever. I know we never had enough uh, uh, Y's, uh, Y's, because in German we don't really need them and I forgot to order, so I just ordered some and he sends me three little Y's in a, in a little envelope. It's great when these things arrive in, at your, on your desk, you know, you suddenly have all this wood type and then you can think, where the hell am I going to put this shit? So wood type is expensive to make, like I said, between two and three euros a, a, a letter. So those 500 will probably will cost me about 1,500 euros in one size only. This is totally stupid. Who's paying for it? Don't, don't tell my wife, my God. She, she doesn't know the prices. Mind you, that would buy only buy one pair of shoes, right? So. But worse than cutting wood is a metal type. I have this friend who had this project and he wanted 60 point accidents medium in metal. So I said, so, okay, we're gonna cast it for you. And while we're at it, uh, we can have an, an, uh, an ad sign and arrows and, and, and stuff, which of course didn't exist in the, in the 50s. Um, so we made matrices for this. When, when I, I talked to Rainer Gerstenberg in Darmstadt, he said, I have most of the matrices but I don't have an S and I don't have an ampersand and stuff. So I make drawings and we have somebody in Poland this time, not in Romania, who makes matrices in little brass matrices with a CNC machine and I send them to Rainer and we cast type. Now, as you can see here also, it's, uh, so that's three and a half thousand euros for one size. It's 50 euros a kilo and you need about, you know, 30, 40, 50 kilos. It is stupid, and I won't use that type because it's going to get destroyed. So it sits there, it gleams. I will use it on a, on a proofing press, but not in the Heidelberg windmill because it'll you know, just destroy it. So we have new type. I have no idea why. But the best thing is, and that's really why I'm here now, is the post-digital printing. Um, when you talk about letterpress these days, I don't know whether it's hit Barcelona yet, but it started in kind of in Brooklyn, you know, the hipster letterpress. Those kids with the, you know, the hats and the, the, the beards um, that take 20 minutes to pour a coffee. Um, they also are into Heidelberg windmills and, and, and letterpress because it's kind of cool. And they do this, which is, of course, when I, I, I was an apprentice as a typesetter, um, you would get killed for this because this is how you destroy type, by pre pressing it into the paper. But of course, this is not type, this is polymer, plastic, nylon. 
Uh, so the invention of nylon, which is you know, from the 60s, uh, rescued letterpress. Not the sort of letterpress that goes into the museums, not the fine print people, but the popular stuff is basically all wedding invitations. I don't know how many people get married, but the industry lives by wedding invitations uh, and, and that sort of stuff, and maybe business cards. So while I don't really like that style, it helped, at least in, in the United States, letterpress to survive. There are 15,000 Van der Cook proof presses in America, and they, t they sell for 15 to $20,000 each. $20,000 for a Vander Cook? I can buy one for 200 here uh, in Germany. Not a Vander Cook, they are not very good machines, but they're, they're wobbly, but you know, they're American, they're light. Uh, and then the reason is mostly because they have garages. They don't live in apartments like we do. They, they have, live in the suburbs and have a garage, and you know, they have five cars, so they take one car out and put a letterpress instead, um, which is okay. The good thing is that if you're in the United States, you can buy ink, you can buy paper in small amounts, uh, you can buy tubes of ink. I have to buy 10 kilos. They can buy like, you know, like toothpaste, because uh, they print only little, you know, invitations, and then they sell them on Etsy or eBay. It's a little scary, but it helped the, press, the business to survive. Nylon print. Meanwhile, back in Berlin, Spiekermann says, I like letterpress printing. We have these Heidel we have two Heidelberg cylinders, we have the big Johannesberg, and I have, I don't know, 20 or so proofing presses. Um, you know, it's time we made some money with it. So we um, talked to people in the Flexo print industry, because they have, oh, I forgot to mention, sorry. <laughs> the uh, the nylon prints, the, the polymers are made with a negative. So you send your data to a, a, a bureau and they make a negative and you make a plate from that. Now in Berlin, we only have one place left that makes negatives. I don't know what it's like here, probably not many either. In America, they have a lot. So I wanted to have a process where I don't need a negative. The Flexo people, you know, Flexo is that rubber print method that prints mostly um, emballages and packaging. So we found this, these engineers in Hanover who make these, these uh, laser setters. Um, and we said, well, we, we, we want a, a plate that's metal backed. I'll tell you in a minute why. Uh, and polymer on the other side. And we want to, to cut it directly without a negative. So we send our data to the, to the, uh, the machine and it cuts a plate. And you can see this is all handmade. Uh, it's taken about two years. I think today the mechanics are back in Berlin because things go wrong sometimes. You know, when you, when you burn laser, you create dust. So we literally put a vacuum cleaner there. And then, you know, too much air is too bad, not enough air. So basically it sucks when it sucks and it sucks when it doesn't suck. Um, it's difficult. Uh, and there's a lot of string involved in rubber bands and, and duct tape and stuff to make it work, but it works. So we make these plates. The Heidelberg cylinder we have is 52 by 72 or 54 by 72 centimeters. So we got eight pages. These are the books we print. And we put them onto a ma magnetic base, which actually was made in Spain. 5,000 euros for that size magnetic base. And you can slip in the plate because it's metal backed and it sits there and it doesn't move. And we can change a plate in about 10 minutes because you can print four or five forms a day, one, one printer in May, eight or nine hours. While, I mean, if you're a, a sort of letterpress printer, eight hours uh, is actually a day and a night, but we call it eight hours because that's all we can pay for. But, you know, you don't go home at five o'clock, obviously. So we print books, and we found a publisher in Germany, Zorkamp, and persuaded them to start a series called Zorkamp Letterpress, it's called letterpress by now in Germany. If you call it Buchdruck, nobody would know what you're talking about. Because it's obviously, you know, Buchdruck means book printing, literally. But it, because that's, that's, as we heard from Alan, that's what it used to be. But now it's called letterpress, even in Germany. And we can get pretty good quality. We can, we can print five colors if necessary, but it would be too expensive. We can print two colors, and uh, we can get pretty good detail. Uh, you know, it's a very large, the register is perfect. We can do a 60-line a screen. Uh, that's metric. Uh, we don't really want to, but we can. And, and this, this is a, we have two Heidelbergs. This is the one from 1956, I think, and it works. I mean, you have to have new rollers in there, obviously, every now and again, and you have to hold it up for register. And we find interesting things, because we're not printers. Daniel, who is doing it, he's a typesetter like I am, and because uh, there are no more printers, letterpress printers. 
in, in West Germany, we, we stopped training letterpress people in the early 70s. In East Germany, they went on a little later uh, because they had, you know, old technology. But essentially, all the people who learned letterpress printers are in their 70s. They don't want to work anymore. So we're learning. For example, we, I know I digress, but we have, you have a minute. We started um, printing really slowly because we wanted to get nice thick ink and stuff. And then we found that in the middle of the sheet, the ink was heavier than on the edges. Well, if you ever had physics, you realize if, as the rollers rotate, they actually lift up in the middle. It's called centrifugal force. We didn't know this. And so we, now we have to print at least 1,500 an hour. If you print slower, the rollers sag in the middle and you get bad inking. So this cost us tons of paper to find out. In fact, most of these books were printed twice and then thrown away because there weren't good enough still issues in there. But if you look at it, you know, this is, um, it's nice and black. I mean, that's one thing about offset has to do with water, obviously. So it's always a little water, it's always gray. Even if I, if I design a book on, on, on the Mac now, I would use a slightly heavier weight. A lot of typefaces have a regular and a book weight, so I would use the book weight because in offset it'll go thinner anyway. In letterpress, I've got to go the other way around. I have to use a, the thinner weight because it adds, adds a little, but it's nice and black. So we have seven books. One is still at, at the bookbinders right now. Uh, we print a thousand, they're all numbered. We have a little leaflet at the back explaining the process. And the reason why the publishers are doing that, Zorkamp, is, and the book, the book uh, shops love it, because they want to, to bring back the interest in, in people about how books are made. You know, people think, oh, I, people come, I wrote a book. I said, no, you didn't write a book. You wrote a text. Then it takes me and editors and typesetters and printers and designers and bookbinders to make it into a book. People don't realize. They think, why does it cost 29 euros? You know, it's just a book. Yes, because so many people are involved and trees have to die and ink has to be made and fingers get squashed and stuff. It's a, it's a long process that involves quite a few people. So these little objects cost 10 euros more than the offset ones, but they, they have this added value other than just being a thousand and being... Um, Signed, not signed, but at least numbered. And there was a, the one uh, other project I did recently, which is this, this ridiculous uh, brick. A friend of mine, Luis Rosetto, was the founder of Wired magazine that the younger people here might know. Actually, it's been around for 25 years. In 93, he started Wired magazine, which was the sort of Bible of the digital business. And he wrote uh, this book about uh, one week in 1998, when the whole internet exploded and then imploded shortly after, as we remember. Um, and I said, why don't we print this letterpress? I mean, it is totally stupid. You, 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 the, the, the history of the digital revolution in letterpress is, is uh, well, ironic at least. So we printed 2,500 of these books and uh, 2,000 are gone already for 98 euros. That's not bad. So we're not making money, but we, we learned a lot. Um, and of course, it's got all the, you know, the, the personally punched holes and stuff. So I call that, you know, letterpress printing, a book about the digital revolution, the, the revenge of the analog. La revancha del analog, no? Or something. Does that, that exist? I know how the revancha del tango, I know that, that music, so this is kind of, this is... Where, where, where we come back and said, okay, guys, you know, digital is fun. We all live digital. I'm not going to throw away my iPhone anytime soon, but it's time to go back and be real. We eat real bread. We are real people. We are atoms, not bits. And it's nice to touch something. And now I have a little job for our uh, interpreters up there. Can you translate this? Um, I can hardly translate it into German. It's so complicated. The well of impression is that. This is what I'm talking about. Even here you can see that uh, if you take away the ink, where, where the, the impression goes, now this is a little overdone. I wouldn't press that deeply. That would dis be destroying the machine. It would be cheating. But there's a little white reflection as the, the crater goes in. The light catches the edge. And that is, we don't know this. We don't see this, but we feel this. This is the difference between, this is, this is wool. This is not nylon. I wouldn't want to wear nylon. Cool, by the way, right? Um, Paul Smith gave it me for my birthday. 
last year. Um, I couldn't afford a Postman Institute otherwise, believe me. Um, so this is why we like letterpress printing. We may not know, but we kind of sense this. This is, this is physical, this is three-dimensional, because life is three-dimensional, and offset is two-dimensional, and the computer is two-dimensional. I know we have uh, artificial intelligence and, and virtual reality and all this stuff, but it's still two-dimensional. This is one screen. How can people say you can see you can do 3D? No, 2D. This is only one surface. So we do 3D again. Let me uh, sort of summarize. Um, we do preservation by production. We use our machines because they get better over time. We find out how they work. We have people who can make parts for them. Uh, we bring in hopefully new people who want to learn the trade. If anybody here wants to be a letterpress printer, call me. We need one urgently. We have more books to print. And, uh, you know, Daniel is on his own. I sometimes go there and we can only do one shift. We have enough work for two shifts. We might even pay back our debts at some time. So, uh, as far as I'm concerned, letterpress is back. And this has been my motto forever anyway. You, you may translate this. It's already just needs to be made. That's been my motto forever, you know. It's all there, but shit, normally somebody's got to sit down and do it. Okay, I think it's time we went to go and have a drink and eat. Gracias. Thank you very much. Good evening. So if, any, if anybody wants to look at these books, come and, come and have a look. Uh, Eric. Eh, muchas gracias por esta divertidísima conferencia que nos ha dado. Me parece que todos nos ha encantado y hemos reído mucho. Eh, a mí me ha parecido personalmente también apasionante esta carrera, la evolución de pasar de su juventud por el plomo, luego pasar por la fotocomposición, luego por el digital y el gran milagro, el hombre vuelve otra vez a la técnica de impresión tipográfica. Realmente ahí está Gutenberg y ahí su gran invento, que hoy todavía perdura. Muchas gracias a todos y espero veros mañana, en la segunda, los que os habéis apuntado mañana o pasado, pues estaremos encantados de volveros a ver. Y muchas gracias por estar aquí.